I'm sure you actually want to hear this great content because this is something very important to all of us. So without any further ado, I'm going to get off the stage. So please give a warm Sunday morning welcome to Kurt and Bill. All right. Good morning, everybody. I am so pleased to see you came here 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. Hope you had a good Saturday night. Uh, and thanks for coming out to hear us talk about crossing the border. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I am the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I'll be giving this talk with my colleague Bill. Uh, so the first half, we're going to talk about some of the law and policy issues around crossing the border. Uh, and then Bill will be talking about uh, technical strategies for crossing the border with your electronic devices. Um, so starting it out, uh, like, what, why is this important? Why do we, why do we care about uh, the security and privacy of our digital devices? Well, as an initial matter, your device is a window into your soul. Your lives are documented all throughout your phones, your laptops. Uh, it contains private conversations that you might uh, only be containing on that phone. Uh, your family photos, medical documents, could have uh, confidential financial information, legal information, what websites you're visiting, your search history, all of these things are on your phone in a way that's kind of unprecedented in our society, that you just simply couldn't previously walk around with this much information because it wouldn't fit in your pocket, but now it does. Uh, and uh, I have a quote here from the uh, Riley uh, versus California decision. This was from 2014 in the US Supreme Court, uh, where they were recognizing that modern cell phones uh, are something different from we've ha what we had before. Uh, they contain so much, they say, they may hold for many Americans the privacies of life. And the Riley case was a very important recognition of that. It was dealing with uh, questions about whether you could search uh, in somebody's pocket. Well, you kids could search in someone's pocket under existing law, and the uh, uh, government wanted that to mean, and therefore they could search what was on the phone using the exception that was trying to find if you had a knife in your pocket to see what was on your phone. Uh, and the court did not buy into that uh, uh, expansion, and we started to have uh, a series of cases that have been expanding upon the legal protections for the phone in your pocket. Uh, one of the things that they can hold is privileged information. So as, as a society, or at least in the most democratic societies, there's a recognition that some information should be privileged from discovery privilege from the government getting it. One of the ones that uh, I'm an attorney, so I have a special uh, place in my heart for the attorney-client privilege. Uh, this is information that would be, of course, extremely useful to the government when trying to convict someone of a crime, but because we want to have an adversarial system where you can have an attorney representing uh, a defendant and have good communications, the government is not allowed to look into those communications. It has to hold back. We've also recognized some privileges uh, for reporters so they can uh, uh, talk to their sources without at least uh, uh, that much fear of being held out, though uh, sometimes uh, uh, that privilege can be overcome. Doctor-patient privilege, some places recognize a privilege for talking to your uh, uh, religious uh, uh, confessor. Uh, and these are, are things that it makes sense for society to say, no, we don't want to have these things invaded in the privacy, but those things may exist on your phone. Uh, also for the overview, what is a border? I mean, you can, the obvious border is at the edge of a, of a country, um, but uh, some things are not as obvious. Uh, international airports are considered to be borders. Um, and uh, oftentimes the special powers that, uh, that governments have at the border can extend beyond the border in the United States. It's 100 miles from the border, and if you take a map of the United States and sketch out where 100 miles is, that actually is a fair amount of the country. Um, and then uh, uh, a note on some unusual situations. In Europe, they have the Schengen Zone, a customs union, uh, and there are political borders within it, but not uh, customs borders. So they're not going to do searches as you cross between, say, Belgium and the Netherlands, because they're all part of the same customs union. Till recently, uh, UK was also part of that. Uh, so now they will uh, uh, eventually, Brexit will be completed. Now the Schengen Zone? All right. Part of you. Thank you for the correction. Uh, sadly. It is so convenient to be able to go from one country to the other without having to be stopped 
and searched. Uh, so governments assert special powers at the, at the border. Uh, but nevertheless, these special powers are not without limit. They're not above human rights law and policy. In the United States, the, the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution comes up frequently in a border context, uh, which are protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, under the UN Declaration of Human Rights, there's a recognition that there shouldn't be arbitrary interference with privacy and family. Uh, it's also recognized in a lot of other international laws and treaties. So. In the U.S., as you come in, uh, they can ask you to do a lot of things. We'll go into this a little bit more detail, but they can ask you to unlock your device, to provide the device password, to disclose some of your social media handles so they can look you up online. Uh, and then what happens when you refuse or if you refuse? If you're a U.S. citizen, you cannot be denied entry. So you can refuse. You may have some consequences for that, but you'll still get in the country. If you're a permanent resident, a green card holder, you can refuse, but this may raise questions about the status of your, of your green card, whether you'll be able to transition that, that green card. So it doesn't necessarily uh, mean the end, but it can raise some questions that might ultimately lead to losing that status. And for others, people who are coming in on a visa, they can deny entry for any reason. So they could be like, great, you're not going to hand over your, your phone, but you have to turn around and come back, uh, go back to where you came from. Uh, the number of searches on the rise. Uh, this is a chart showing uh, the number of device searches over time. If you go back to uh, fiscal year 12, uh, about 5,000, keeps around five or 6,000 for the next couple of years, and then starts to rise dramatically. Uh, the most recent year we have uh, uh, numbers for, fiscal year 19, which ended last uh, fall, uh, up to 40,000 searches. So it's an, an increasing number. But I still want to put that into perspective. Over 400 million people came into the United States last year. So on a percentage basis, the odds of getting a device search as you cross the border are actually fairly low. When they do it, the CPB, the Customs and Border Patrol, they conduct a primary inspection of everybody who's coming in. They'll review the documents, such as your, your passport, a visa if you needed one, and they make a determination of whether to either admit so you can go into the country, or to do a secondary inspection. Secondary inspections are more intensive, and that's where it may involve an electronic search. Uh, there can be two types of those. A manual search, where they pick up the phone, leaf through it for a bit, see what's on there, maybe check out the photos. Uh, and then an advanced search. An advanced search is where they would copy the drive uh, and do uh, a forensic analysis sometimes, uh, and try and get all the information that's on the phone. And then they document what they're doing with something called an EMR, electronic media report, showing some details about the device, what kind of search they did, any remarks the officer may have had about the, the interaction, and put that on the file. So here's a, a chart that the uh, Office of Inspector General put together comparing basic and manual search. So uh, on the left, how a basic search, that's pretty straightforward. They search it, they visually inspect it, and then they probably will return the device to the traveler uh, unless they found something. Advanced search, well, you can see they redacted two of these sections, uh, but you can see in the unredacted parts that they will do it to uh, uh, do a forensic search, copy everything, and then upload that to the automated targeting system, or ATS. Uh, and then theoretically, they are supposed to uh, destroy it from the, uh, the copy that the CPB retained, uh, and then uh, for your device itself, it would eventually be returned, uh, or it may be detained further if they have found a violation of the law. The ATS is what they call a decision support tool. Uh, so it is a big database that allows them to compare the traveler information they provided against the information in their records, uh, and then it gives a risk assessment to those travelers based on that information. Uh, so for advanced searches, they copy it onto a thumb drive and upload it into ATS. Um, they have a, a privacy document about the a ATS system, uh, and they don't provide notice of everything that they're going to do to you on this, but they say that uh, this privacy risk is mitigated because they do mention this in their privacy notice, which I'm sure all of you have read. Uh, so you're well, well informed. 
Uh, after this, you get your prize, which is a two-pager about the search. It's sort of like the thing you might find in your luggage if TSA uh, looked at it, and you see a little prize when you open it up later. Uh, they ordinarily keep your device for less than five days, but there's no actual limit with a supervisor's approval. They can keep it uh, for, for much longer, and sometimes it can be up to uh, several months. Uh, and then they also, the data that they get here, is shared and made available to other agencies who may keep that information as long as they think is appropriate. So it could actually end up being around for quite some time. Uh, there was a uh, uh, report by the Office of Inspector General. This is a, a body of the government that checks to see if all the, the rules are being followed. Uh, they did a look at uh, how border searches were going for electronic devices. Uh, they reviewed 194 of these electronic media reports, and they found problems in 67% of them, which is a, it's a pretty high number. Uh, two of the more prominent problems, uh, that uh, one is that they were supposed to be disconnecting the cell phones from the network when they were doing the search, and they found that they were not consistently doing so. And another one was after they upload the data into the ATS system, they're supposed to delete it from the, uh, the border agent's thumb drive, and they found they were not consistently doing that. Um, in addition, at the border, and what's gonna be on the ATS might be information that they gather through other means, such as your social media. Uh, back in 2017, they announced extreme vetting, uh, and this was to look more closely at what people are saying uh, elsewhere, uh, and maybe ask them some questions about that if they cross the, uh, the border. Uh, and this program, it started out only being used in limited circumstances, but they have uh, continued to expand it um, and they were doing it uh, as of May 2019, all visa applicants. Uh, and that is a very large category of people. Um, in the U.S., that we have uh, 710,000 immigrant visa applications and 14 million non-immigrant visa applications. So they're looking at a lot of different uh, social media posts. In some cases, we, we've seen uh, where people have been denied entry based on things that were on their social media. In a particular case, it wasn't because of what someone said, but they were friends with people on social media, and those friends said some things that were concerning to the officers, and so that was enough to deny entry. Um, and they have proposed expanding it for applications for immigration benefits. This is a little bit uh, uh, beyond the border, but this is when someone wants to change their status uh, to become naturalized as a citizen, to seek asylum, uh, or use the visa waiver program, and trying to get this information and make a determination based in part upon it. Uh, the Brennan Center, which is a, 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 a legal clinic, uh, has sued over this law starting uh, in December, so we'll see how that case goes. But in the meantime, the program is in effect. Uh, so how does this happen? Why are they allowed to do all this, this search? Well, there is a notion of the border search exception to your standard rights that you might have while not at the border. And they say constitutional protections do apply, but uh, they, you don't need to get a, a warrant uh, or probable cause. Um, and instead, if it's a routine search, like just looking through your bags as they might ordinarily do, doesn't require anything, no individualized suspicion. For a non-routine search, it needs to have a, a higher standard of suspicion, and a non-routine search is one that is considered to be highly intrusive, that impact your dignity and privacy interests. Uh, and uh, this came up a lot, uh, at least initially, what made something a non-routine search was when they were doing uh, body cavity searches. They were looking for drugs most, uh, most often, and the courts recognized that that was a pretty intrusive search. Uh, where the interesting question came with devices is, is that also an intrusive search? And I would submit it is because of how much information is on your phone. Uh, and the Supreme Court has stepped it up. As I was mentioning, Riley uh, found at protections to search a mobile phone. A warrant was required there. In a case called US v. Carpenter, the Supreme Court uh, reinforced the Riley decision and uh, expanded it to location uh, tracking 
and declined to extend the third party doctrine. The third party doctrine is the notion that if your information is held by somebody else, then you no longer care about the privacy of it and should have lesser protections. Uh, so the state of the law right now is, in, is a bit in flux. Uh, for two courts of appeal, they have found that forensic search required reasonable suspicion, but the manual search did not. Uh, in the Ninth Circuit, they've clarified as well the search has to be for contraband. This is the notion that it's not just a search to see if there's anything going on with your phone, but they need to be searching for something that is illegal to have on the phone, that the actual contraband they're trying to stop at the border is on the device itself or on your laptop or such. Uh, this often comes up in the context of uh, child sexual exploitation where the actual photos are the contraband, but is also recognizing the, the notion that uh, why do we have a border search to stop things from being smuggled in, and so you should be looking for the things you're trying to exclude. Uh, in the 11th Circuit, they upheld forensic search without a suspicion of wrongdoing, uh, and then the 7th Circuit had the opportunity to rule on this, but decided not to. I also have a picture here of the various circuits, so basically our courts of appeal are divided into uh, 11 circuits. Uh, well, one more DC in the federal circuit, so a total of 13. Uh, and uh, here we are in DC, so it's the DC circuit. Out in California, it's the ninth circuit, and you can see by the numbers there. And the notion is with the circuits, it applies as a binding decision in the circuit itself, but it is merely some potentially persuasive information if you're not in the circuit. So that means the law will vary from place to place. Uh, a case that EFF has brought, Al-Assad versus DHS. We sued on behalf of these lovely uh, 11 travelers. We are arguing that the Constitution requires a warrant before doing an electronic search of your device. Uh, and we run a critical ruling back in November. Uh, it wasn't everything we asked for. It didn't find that a warrant was required, but it did find that the Fourth Amendment does require reasonable suspicion and that a device contains digital contraband. So this is a, uh, a district court decision. Uh, so it is uh, in the uh, uh, District of Massachusetts. Uh, and the scope of the decision at this point is these 11 people. So uh, the court has ruled with respect to the plaintiffs who, who brought the case. Uh, but we are hoping that uh, both sides have uh, appealed this decision a little bit more, more detail here. But both sides have appealed the decision. We want to get uh, established that a warrant is required. The government wants to establish that reasonable suspicion is not required. And so it'll go up to the First Circuit Court of Appeal, which is on the path of getting it to become a binding ruling over a larger swath of territory. Uh, so the court said no to wholly suspicionless or random searches, and also searches based on a hunch. Instead, they have to uh, have reasonable suspicion that is specific and articulable facts considered together with the rational interferences that can be drawn from that fact. So that's adding rationality and it's enabling a court to review to say, was that a rational decision? Was it a reasonable suspicion based on the circumstances? And they have to be searching for digital contraband. As I was just mentioning, they're trying to say it's limited to actually smuggling things through, the, through your phone, through your laptop, uh, and not seeing just information about what kind of person you are or things like that. Um, and at least uh, for, for this court, it was rejecting this distinction between manual and forensic search. For some courts, they were saying one was intrusive for the forensic search, but manual where they flipped through the phones uh, uh, with their hands, not a big deal. I think both of these things are quite a big deal and can reveal uh, important information about your lives, and it's sensible to require uh, a high standard, hopefully a, a warrant, but at least reasonable suspicion for both. Uh, another important thing at the, at the border uh, is uh, the cloud. Under US policy, they are supposed to disconnect it from the network, though as we found in most circumstances, they were not, um, and only look at the stuff that is physically resident on the devices, again, focusing on the contraband issue. Um, and they are not supposed to be taking advantage of how your device may be logged into cloud services and searched through the rest of your life. 
uh, as the Supreme Court said in the Riley decision, if you just find a key in, their, in someone's pocket, that doesn't mean you can go ahead and search their house. Um, also, uh, uh, pass, passwords, fingerprints, also with face, uh, uh, face recognition. So if they're trying to get onto your device and having a, a password, there is a stronger set of laws about whether you can refuse to provide that. The courts are still going back and forth on, on the extent to which the, uh, the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination applies to uh, passwords. But if it's your fingerprint, uh, then the border agents could just force your finger onto the phone and that is not gonna have the, uh, the Fifth Amendment implications. Uh, and also the government may have a record for your fingerprints and we've at least seen some, some examples where uh, people have shown you can take information about a fingerprint and try to use that to break into a fingerprint lock device, uh, possibly that's going to be in with facial recognition as well. So it's not going to be as strong a protection as a passcode if you're using biometrics at the border. I want to mention a couple of uh, uh, possible legislations. So these are not uh, uh, bills that are moving particularly fast, but uh, have been introduced to have a, have a stronger uh, set of uh, circumstances, add a warrant requirement, and we are, we are hopeful that uh, uh, some of these things might move forward, though currently Congress has been very busy with a number of other things, uh, and I'm not particularly optimistic that these, uh, these bills will move forward. But uh, that is another possible solution. We're mostly working on the getting the courts to rule about it uh, strategy. Uh, so that was about the U.S. I also wanted to say just a little bit about the, uh, the European uh, Union. If you travel to the U uh, EU, you have to go uh, a minimum check. And if you're in non-EU countries, you get a thorough check. Uh, and it starts out with some pre-border check using uh, uh, the available information that the airlines provide to uh, their, the receiving country. Uh, and they take a look at, your, at the first line. Um, and basically, if they find that these questions, they need to ask further questions, get more clarification, if they determine there's a higher risk, then it goes to a second line check, a further examination, and that's where uh, you might get some, some searches uh, and entry uh, allowed or refused or referral to yet even more thorough of a check. Um, some of the things that lead to uh, second line checks is if there are communication difficulties, if they you know, can't understand what you're saying, uh, if your documentation doesn't match up, uh, or if they look you up in a database and there is a mismatch between the database information and the information you're saying, or there's a signal in the database saying, watch out for this, uh, this traveler. Uh, I also have a chart here showing that it, it varies fairly widely, uh, the number of uh, searches between uh, various uh, 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 airports. Charles de Gaulle apparently has the most, while Frankfurt has the least, which uh, this may be just happenstance for the time that they did this study, but it's a pretty significant difference. Uh, nevertheless, even though the, the European Union has border, uh, uh, you know, doesn't have borders between the various countries in the, uh, in the area, in the Sengen zone, the national laws define the rules for search, so which airport you go into will be setting up what the law is with respect to how much they can search. But the US, uh, sorry, EU Agency for Fundamental Rights uh, has something to say about it and has put out some uh, strictures how those rights apply. Uh, you're allowed to do things to verify who somebody is, what their nationality, and search for dangerous objects or criminal evidence, but it's not free room. Uh, a couple more words about like, before we get into uh, what you can do about some of these things. So when you're considering crossing the border and you're thinking about how you should uh, prepare for that, the first thing we recommend is thinking about your threat model. Who are you? What is your citizen, residence, immigration status? Uh, what kind of travel history do you have or law enforcement history? What is your tolerance for hassle and delay? Uh, if you are very tolerant of hassle and delay, you have a lot more options to do things at the border to push back against search. If you really need to get somewhere, you should uh, think about that before you do something that might get you uh, overnight in the, uh, uh, in the entry area. 
uh, and some people want to make a statement. They, they actually want to have a uh, uh, stand up for their rights and make a statement in order, even though that may cause that delay. Uh, the second thing you should think about, the second category, is your data. What is the sensitivity of the data that is on your devices? Uh, if, what is the risk you face if it is seized? You know, will you be in a, in a bad way if you don't have access to your device? Or you lose the information on the device? Um, do you need it where you need to go? Uh, and one of the things we're going to talk about is not carrying things and then getting them from the, uh, the network after you get to your destination. Uh, but then you should think about the quality of the network to the place where you're traveling, whether that's a viable, uh, viable option. So then before you arrive, uh, you should be talking to your employer. If there are your work devices, find out what their policies are and recommendations. If they say, you know, hand it over or call us, uh, find out what your work has to say about it. Uh, protect what you're carrying. So backups in case something goes wrong putting on encryption uh, for your uh, stored data, using a strong passphrase. Uh, for social media and online accounts, log out. I mean, yes, in the, in the US we're saying the policy wasn't to use the fact that you're logged in to look at it, but you can also log out of the device, so it requires a password to get back onto your Facebook or your Twitter, so that they either have to uh, uh, ask you for it or not get onto it very easily. But most importantly, don't bring it. Uh, that the strongest protection you're going to have for keeping your data safe as you cross a border is to not have that data. Uh, so you might use a temporary device that you're uh, only using for purposes of traveling, something like a Chromebook or a burner phone. Uh, delete the data that you don't need. Move it to the cloud. You can download it later once you get to your target uh, country using uh, things like VPN or other encryption methods so that you can have the data that you need but not have it with you at the, uh, at the time of crossing the border. Uh, just before we began, someone raised the question, what about plausible deniability? And I've certainly heard some ideas people have. It's like, well, why don't you hide it so that you can show somebody a boring thing and secretly have the rest of your stuff uh, elsewhere on your device. Uh, this is a question of are you better at hiding than they are at finding? The consequences of them finding is that, that is extremely suspicious and they will think that you are a terrible person that needs to be detained. Uh, so I think not bringing it and picking it up later, later is going to be far better than trying the we can hide it better than they can find it game. Uh, once you get to the border, Think about what you're going to do before you cross it. Be prepared for this. Be always polite and respectful, even if you want to do this to make a statement, to push back. There's no reason to do it without being polite, uh, and that will help a situation later if we have to litigate over that. Do not lie to the border agents. You can be, uh, have separate problems from lying, uh, and that, that could actually be worse trouble than you would be if they took your device. Uh, do not physically interfere with the search, trying to, trying to stop them by, by holding a phone back or uh, trying to stop them from getting into your bags. If you have privileged information with you, you should assert those privileges so that you have informed them that those privileges exist. Uh, but if they're going to go in, they're going to go in. And then very importantly, if you're thinking about a situation where you might litigate afterwards, document everything you can, get the names, the badge numbers, try to uh, create as strong a record as possible about what happened and get a receipt for any information, any devices that get seized, which will be very helpful if you want to try and get those devices back later and they're not giving them. Uh, something that's going to come up in some of these circumstances is consent, where they'll say something along like, may I search your device? Uh, and this is something to be careful about because you don't want a circumstance in which uh, it, it was a politely asked request under the circumstances. It also is very threatening. You're in a, a windowless cubicle. There's agents around. It feels like a pretty uh, intensive request. But you can clarify whether that is an order or a request. Are you ordering me to do this or are you asking me to do it? And if the answer is, oh, we're just asking you to do it, you can say no. Uh, if it is an order, well, you get to choose how you want to go. One option 
would be to comply with that order. Uh, and that uh, may limit some of your options later, but you're probably gonna have the least amount of hassle and delay. And you've also clarified at least you haven't consented, so you're not giving away your, your rights by having agreed to it. The other option is to refuse to comply. That leads to escalation. Your device will likely be seized. Uh, there'll be records placed on uh, government databases about the situation, uh, which may give you trouble in the future, but this preserves most of your legal options. After the border, uh, one thing to do is continue documenting, write down everything that you can remember from the encounter. You might later want to file Freedom of Information Act requests to get further information about the system uh, through the government. Um, and then change any passwords they might have asked if. If they asked for a password and you gave it, change it because they will be storing that password. And if they get your device in a future circumstance, you don't want them to be able to just look it up and use the password again uh, because they will be saving the credentials. And then if the device you've handed over, even if you got it back, was out of your sight for a while, you might want to consider wiping it or restoring it to uh, factory defaults if you don't know what, what happened to it while it was out of your sight. And that brings us to some technological measures from my colleague Bill. Thanks very much, Kurt. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, in terms of technological measures that you can take, um, first of all, as Kurt mentioned, uh, the best methodology is just not to bring it. If you don't have it with you in the first place, then they can't get any information from it. Uh, it might be useful in certain circumstances to bring a temporary device. Uh, don't log into social media, don't log into various accounts that you have, uh, and just bring that for uh, whatever purposes you want, um, temporary device. Uh, but if you must take your device with you, then there are some measures that you can follow uh, that can protect your device from prying eyes, if done right. So some of the capabilities of law enforcement across the country and the world, um, there are a few companies that are at play here. Uh, the first one I want to mention is Celebrite. Um, two years ago, uh, we gave a similar talk, and this uh, Celebrite company had 40,000 licenses. Um, now they have 60,000 UFED licenses. That uh, gives you kind of an idea of, uh, of their capabilities and their increasing uh, market. Globally, um, they uh, contract with law enforcement across country, border and customs searches, et cetera. They even have a friendly kiosk that you can go to on their website. And they're able to uh, hack, um, they claim any iPhone, uh, including uh, deleted messages, et cetera. Um, they say iPhone running iOS 7 to iOS 12.3. Um, this probably includes uh, some of the latest iPhone uh, iOS versions as well. Um, so uh, be aware that their capabilities are, uh, are very broad in terms of what they claim. Uh, another company in this field is called uh, Greykey, and Greykey is a competitor to Celebrite. Um, it is an Atlanta-based company um, that you know, is involved in forensic analysis uh, as well, imaging your phone, et cetera. Um, this uh, device is available uh, locally in different increments, a $15 uh, or $15,000 level. Um, that allows you to you know, hack some devices, and then a $30,000 level that allows you to hack you know, the rest of the devices. Only available for uh, certain customers, law enforcement, you can't just buy it at a store. Um, this Forbes article kind of uh, raises the question of, um, you know, they, they were able to get into recently a locked iPhone 11 Pro, uh, Pro Max. And, um, and uh, there's, you know, the FBI is still looking for capabilities to hack an older iPhone. So, you know, there's something fishy going on here if they're able to hack the latest iPhone but not previous versions. That's kind of, um, you know, suspicious and makes us, uh, uh, you know, uh, suspect that they might want to set a, a bad precedent here. Gray Shift's customers include uh, Fortune 500 companies, a uh, secret uh, Coast Guard unit called Domex, the U.S. State Department, local and federal police, the FBI, uh, and uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, you know, this, with a, with a $1.2 million contract, which is the largest contract they've ever gotten. So uh, they have no gripes about, uh, you know, uh, making deals with uh, some of the... Um, you know, uh, least friendly uh, law enforcement. 
Uh, all these reports come from Forbes, so I want to give them credit here. Um, and they're, they're doing a, lo a lot of uh, great research into Grayke and Grayshift, the company as well. Um, they even, uh, you know, caught up a deal with uh, the uh, the uh, the IRS. So who's watching me now? Uh, the IRS, as this uh, that '80s, uh, 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 you know, uh, music video showed. And um, there's speculation that uh, Grey Key can uh, can subvert the mechanisms that are built into the iPhone. Um, that uh, you know allow or throttle and uh, lock you out. So uh, Matthew Re uh, Matthew Green, a security researcher, has some speculation as to uh, how quickly they can perform a brute force attack on uh, iOS devices. Um, this is you know if you so you have if you have a six digit code, then um, you know that's that'll take about. 22 hours at worst, um, so you might want to upgrade to a 10-digit code from a six-digit code if you're on iPhone. Uh, Apple's response to all of this has been to introduce this technology called USB restricted mode. Um, it was introduced in I the iOS uh, 12, um, and it basically turns off your Thunderbolt uh, data connection if you haven't unlocked your phone uh, in the last hour. Uh, and uh, in iOS 13.1, they've added this extra mechanism that basically establishes this pairing with uh, your accessories so that there's a list of trusted accessories that you've trusted in the past. Uh, and this uh, shows the UI at the bottom of what that actually looks like. So the number one thing that we can recommend here if you're bringing your device with you crossing the border is to use device encryption. Uh, this is a powerful mechanism to protect your data at rest. Um, you know, notably, this isn't going to protect your data in transit. This is just the data that you have stored on the device at that time. Uh, in most cases, it's separate from screen unlock. Um, you know, if you are talking about your laptop or desktop machine, um, for you know, uh, most uh, devices, handheld devices, that's not the case unless you have something like fingerprint unlock, touch ID, or face ID. So uh, device encryption uh, in iOS uses the Secure Enclave Processor, or SEP. Um, this is a four megabyte flashable uh, uh, separate processor module in the iPhone uh, and many newer Mac devices. It actually runs its own full operating system called SEPOS. Uh, and what it does is if you enter your password uh, or passphrase, uh, multiple times incorrectly, then it'll attempt to throttle that. Say after six times, it'll attempt to throttle it, uh, you know, uh, and not allow you to guess the next passphrase after uh, a certain amount of time. And then after 10 attempts, then it'll uh, lock the phone and you won't be able to get into it at all. Um, this means that um, your, your passphrase here is entangled with data that's stored on the Secure Enclave. Um, this includes the uh, UID, which is baked in at uh, device manufacturer time, as well as the GID, which you can flash. But you cannot exfiltrate those bits after you flash it, presumably unless um, Grey Key has, uh, or Celebrate has some secret technology that allows them to do that. Uh, so the best defense here is, you know, if you're going to secure your device with a, sec with a uh, passphrase, then choose a very good passphrase um, so that even if they are able to bypass it with a secure enclave hack or something like that, um, then, uh, you know, it'll take them a long time to, uh, to uh, actually brute force um, this. Uh, so uh, here's, uh, you know, we, we recommend uh, using five or six random words. Um, this can be resistant against a dictionary attack. Uh, correct horse battery staple uh, shows some of the math behind that in this XKCD comic. Uh, we also uh, have this uh, EFF.org slash dice, which allows you to kind of choose a fully, you know, a, a truly random uh, passphrase um, in this methodology of using four, five, six words. Uh, so capabilities of uh, devices and device encryption. Android has uh, had uh, partial support since Android 4, full support since Android 6. Um, if you're using Google, uh, a OS that uh, has Google Apps included by default. Um, and uh, iOS 
uh, has had device encryption for a very long time. Uh, in Windows, uh, you can use BitLocker, uh, which has been available since Windows uh, 8.1. Notably, in 2018, there was a vulnerability found in BitLocker that uh, it was using the uh, hardware-based encryption for solid-state drives if that capability was, uh, was built into the hardware. Um, so, um, and that's not reliable. You shouldn't trust the SSDs built in uh, hardware encryption. Uh, a lot of them were bypassable, uh, and it wouldn't use any software-based encryption. So you might want to check if your devices are encrypted using BitLocker um, uh, hard, uh, nearly hardware-based encryption with this uh, command here, manage BDE. Uh, also, Veracrypt uh, just uses software-based encryption as well, um, so, so that's a great option. Mac OS has had uh, this available since File Vault 2, and Linux has had it for a very long time as well. Uh, some tips, if you're, <laughs> if you're encrypting your device, do not forget your passphrase. Uh, one tip I like to use is if I'm not using a drive very much and it hasn't encrypted, uh, 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 pa you know, you're using a passphrase you don't use very much, I just set a Google reminder for myself every week or so to refresh my memory on that passphrase. Um, turn off fingerprint and face unlock. As Kurt mentioned, this can be used by law enforcement very easily. Uh, and uh, turn off your device when crossing the border um, because that power cycle makes it so that you need to re-enter your uh, actual passphrase and it, uh, you know, your fingerprint or face is not, um, is not asked for. You must unlock it with your passphrase in that case. Uh, now going into secure deletion, you don't need to be like Elliot Alderson in Mr. Robot. Um, there are some ways to uh, do secure deletion reliably. Um, simple deletion does not actually remove the data from a drive. It removes the demarcation of that file as a file, but it does not actually delete data. Um, border agents have sophisticated tools to undelete files, but you can do this at home pretty easily. Um, but secure deletion can be used uh, in this case to remove files, um, and usually by uh, doing a zero uh, overwrite. So uh, you can do this with um, USB flash drives, but there might not be a way to securely delete uh, files. Um, this uh, capabilities of certain SSDs have trim and uh, deterministic zero at trim, uh, which comes close. You can check if you uh, have the ability to do deterministic uh, zero at trim uh, using this command. And formatting, um, sometimes you see something like quick format or high level format that doesn't actually delete data from the device. Uh, low level formatting or secure formatting will delete data from that device. Um, and uh, some tools, um, there's, you should make this distinction between wiping individual files and also wiping uh, free space. And uh, you know, with Linux and Windows, you can use this uh, application called BleachBit, which deletes uh, free space as well as individual files, and also deletes some things that you might not even think of, like your browsing history, et cetera. It's not the, a perfect tool, but it uh, gets the job done pretty well. Uh, deleting files in Mac OS can be done with RM-P. Older uh, tools have been deprecated. And um, you know, I think that the thing that you could do, and I think that probably the best thing you can do, is use device encryption in the first place and wipe the decryption keys if you need to securely delete the entire drive. If it's uh, encrypted, then that's, you know, if you're, if you're using good encryption that's not crackable, then that's, uh, it's not gonna be an issue. You can, uh, you know, simply wipe that device, uh, the, the copy of the decryption keys from that device. You can do this in Linux by removing uh, or erasing the Lux slot that contains your passphrase. Um, and you can, uh, this is built into Chromebooks with power wash uh, or factory reset in iOS. Trusted boot is an important mechanism that you can use to uh, ensure that the boot process is secured and it hasn't been tampered with by Customs and Border Patrol. Um, you can use a, a, you know, this actually requires a, a trusted platform module or equivalent, um, and it does so by verifying the entire boot sequence when you're booting up the device. Um, TPMs uh, can be used to issue something like a, a time-based one-time password authentication. I think this is a really cool uh, application. You can see this um, is uh, basically verifying your boot sequence by having 
uh, you know, Google, uh, uh, Google Authenticator, uh, give you a one-time pass uh, phrase um, that's baked into uh, the TPM in your uh, machine to verify that boot process. Um, this is what trusted boot looks like in iOS, Android, and Lineage. Um, it's important to know that trusted boot is available in iOS, um, has been for a, a while. Android, um, it only supported in stock Android, Graphene OS, and Copperhead OS. In Linux, uh, you, you know, various uh, distributions have had this for a long time. Uh, Chrome OS, it's been baked into it since the beginning. Mac OS, various models of uh, Mac uh, machines have had it, uh, especially in the last few years. And uh, Windows 8.1 and Windows 10 have a mechanism called Secure Boot, which is a UEFI standard, uh, UEFI standard, which l loads Trusted Boot. And this is kind of what it uh, looks like. It actually bootstraps from trusted boot, from, from secure boot to trusted boot. Uh, and in terms of cloud storage, um, there are often legal protections uh, at play for cloud, cl cloud storage in general, but they can be, um, but um, you know, this is part of a process called data minimization. If you're at the border, you might wanna upload the uh, data that you have from your machine, uh, from your device to the cloud. Um, you know, and this uh, is good for also for theft, um, so that if your device is uh, stolen, then uh, it's harder for a thief to get that information. But of course, there is no cloud, there's just other people's computers. Um, this data can be accessed by governments, um, by the legal process, hackers uh, can hack into the cloud, and most services uh, that uh, have uh, cloud, uh, or most cloud-based backup services don't do not actually uh, encrypt the data before you upload it to the cloud. So, um, you know, uh, there is this, uh, this thing called zero knowledge in the industry which allows you to encrypt the data before you ever upload it to the cloud, thus protecting it from snoopers and hackers, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and you, again, have to remember your passphrase uh, just as you do with full encryption uh, in order to do this. Here are some services uh, on the left that support it and offer it. Um, Spider Oak, Keybase, Treasure It, Jungle Disk, et cetera. Uh, most notably, the uh, biggest backup services that you might encounter on a daily basis, iCloud, Google Drive, et cetera, do not offer this. So uh, you might want to look into client-side encryption and zero knowledge um, you know, uh, if you're actually, uh, if you want to encrypt your uh, data before it ever reaches the, the cloud. So some of our takeaways here are uh, the best, uh, the best in defense in general is not to bring your device with you in the first place. If you have to bring your device, then uh, use full disk encryption, use trusted boot, uh, and if you uh, combine this with data minimization, uh, this can offer some powerful protections uh, at the border. So uh, I think that we're running out of time. Uh, this concludes our talk, um, but um, you know, I don't think uh, we have time for questions here. If you want to meet us out in the hall or in the lobby, um, then, uh, then uh, that would be great. Uh, and uh, thanks very much for coming here at this early day. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming so early. Great to be here and we'll be just outside. Uh, if you have any further questions, thank you.